Hey guys, Akiba here from Crypto Slate. Today we've got a super interesting project. Um, I had a quick chat with them offline last week. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to lie, I'm extremely excited about this uh, blockchain technology company. I've written articles in the past talking about how in the early stages of the internet, we had AltaVista, we had AOL, we had Lycos, we had Ash Jeeves, all these companies that don't exist anymore. And the internet and Web 2.0 really came about with the introduction of Google. Um, and it kind of, when you think of the early days of the internet, there was no Google that came into fruition and took over the whole space. I'm open to the concept that the same is still true of Web 3 and that companies that are going to really shape the long term future of Web 3 haven't been announced yet. Well, here's a company that might be able to potentially fit that space. It's a blockchain project that seems to do everything that Web3 is doing, um, but arguably better. So stay tuned for this one because it's going to be super exciting. And I'm uh, very happy uh, to be talking with them today. So catch you after the intro. Hello, oh, here we are, and I'm going to bring Oki in. Oki from Kotec, how are you doing, my friend? I'm all right. Thank you very much for having me, Akiba. It's very, very oh, nice no, to be here. Thanks for coming in. As, as I was just uh, saying, we had a little bit of a chat yesterday. I mean, yesterday, it was like Friday, so a few days ago, and um, super, super interesting. So for people that aren't aware of uh, Kotec, um, do you want to give us a bit of an intro, maybe a bit of your sort of backstory, how you've come to, how I've come to be on this call? Yeah, sure. Um... So first and foremost, um, I started being in the IT industry since about the year 2000, 2001, um, mm -hmm. where we actually uh, worked with analog to digital video capturing and uh, recording cards, um, taking Ooh. it, yeah, taking it into into uh, a new frame, taking big big recording cards and putting them into compact smaller cards and developing some things. Then of course, which is, which is which is a big kind of area, wasn't it, in that stage? I mean, I was I was making a feature film around that sort of time, and I had a big Matrox card in my computer yeah. that was sort of this big. I had to use it just to encode video. Now, <laughs> processors can, like, do that on board. Like, Intel chips can do it, like, MP4 conversion really well. So I'm yeah. guessing, like, technology kind of overtook that business, I guess. Yeah, 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 for sure. It's uh, IP cameras and things like this came into play, and you sort of mm -hmm. like, had to digitize it and, and put it into... A digital environment and then uh, of course from there we went into satellite connectivity and gprs connectivity which um, oh. um which basically allowed us to to start understanding how networks work and okay. um, how to deploy certain networks in areas um this was around about in 2002 um and then uh we then from 2002 we actually started developing um, a POS system, which is uh, basically a closed loop banking system, uh, which was actually an accountability platform, um, right. specifically in a cash environment where they were writing handwritten receipt books. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we then actually made it into a digital environment where we used POS terminals, but none of the data was actually stored on the devices itself, sort of like talking about an early form of tokenization, basically. Oh, wow. Because we tokenized a platform or a profile. And then basically we did some distributed storage, which would actually call these informations over a GPRS network with like a, a mag strip or a smart card. Um, mm -hmm. Back in those days was the terminology. And uh, basically being able to say accountability of a particular policy or something like this when they were collecting these fees in rural areas. Um, uh, and uh, this was specifically in South Africa. I was working in, in the rural areas to, to do these types of things and this type of development. We rolled it out um, in around about 2004, five, six. Um, company went really, it, it, it really did a lot of impact, specifically in rural communities. Um, oh, really? And, uh, it was, uh, it, it, it was for a very interesting business model. It was actually for uh, the funeral industry. <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> but um, but it was because of the 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 the, the pension payments, uh, which you had to go and follow in rural areas, and then you had no mm -hmm. connectivity and using a GPRS network to be able to actually call up the data, which we did in in several sections because you could only have like thirty two characters in a message mm -hmm. which is transmitted. And this is why we started tokenizing also the profile so that when you call it up, then it can call it up in several sections and tokenizing ah. the profile actually allowed us to, to do these types of things. Um, so that's, that's, so you're saying like 2004, five, six, like that's three years before Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you've been tokenizing content before Bitcoin even existed. Well, look, smart contracts and uh, blockchain technology, um, let's say it wasn't called blockchain. It was mm -hmm. about an immutable ledger. It was about uh, digitizing basically a profile and then being able to call it back from uh, a distributed network, um, which mm -hmm. is like torrents networks and these types of things. Um, mm -hmm. This was all form, you know, forms part of a type of tokenization. It's just mm -hmm. now it has like a proper name, which is like blockchain technology and tokenization, digitization, these types of things. Mm -hmm. So well, I was I, I was interviewing David Schwarm, who's very much known as kind of the godfather of crypto. And he was talking to me about how um, I think it was the early 90s. He developed something that he called it a chain of blocks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is like, yeah, I didn't quite get the terminology in the marketing um, correct, but you've got a bit of a background in, in marketing as well, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually have a, I, I used to run an advertising and marketing agency um, for many years. Uh, did some really nice uh, clients and sort of like also used my, um, my IT background. I'm, I'm not a qualified, I don't have any qualifications in IT. I'm a self-taught developer. Um, mm -hmm. and of course, you know, uh, with my father being my mentor and also my, my business partner and the chairman of the board, um, I wouldn't say that I'm the best developer right now because we have a huge team, which is absolutely phenomenal. And also knowing my CIO, Rastislav, he's, uh, he's 10 times better than me in any case mm -hmm. in development, but, um, but yeah, uh, this is, yeah, we, 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 we did a lot of advertising and started focusing on digital content, websites. Uh, online presence, these types of things. Also, this was also around about 2006 and onwards um, where I was doing these types of things. I, I actually was doing that on the sideline whilst I was doing the, 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 the development of the closed loop banking system and, and things like this. So. So, so you got background in sort of uh, digital infrastructure, satellite connectivity, tokenization, advertising and marketing. That sounds like quite, quite a, a good kind of basis for for forming a business so that's then led into what you're you've been working on um how, when was the big when did you start working on Kotec? we started working on Kotec in 2013 when we met rastislav I, actually it was it was a little bit earlier it was um how to Kotec was actually founded was because of the e-commerce platform and it was primarily because we couldn't split a payment banks or payment gateways wouldn't allow us to split payments between merchants so that you can do a singular payment as a customer. Mm -hmm. And I met Rastislav in 2013 and we then basically, he started explaining to us how we can do this with an exchange, how we can use blockchain technology um, mm -hmm. and how we can actually move forward. And then basically uh, in 2014, Michael sat us down, my father, and he said, we're going to build our own coin uh, or our own blockchain. Let's put it that way. Not, not a coin because we didn't build the blockchain actually for a coin. We built it for the network. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, when we, when we went through everything, uh, Rastislav and myself said, you're a little bit crazy, dad. And <laughs> he said, uh, well, how long do you think it's going to take? We said around about six years. It took us nine. <laughs> but yeah. But we're finally there and uh, the blockchain's live. And yeah, this is actually where everything started um, in 2000. So the blockchain's called Core Blockchain, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's, okay. uh, it's, it's Core Blockchain. Um, what differentiates it is, uh, first and foremost, it's a fully decentralized blockchain, which is using the same type of proof of work, but we redevelop the algorithm to actually make it proof of distributed efficiency. Um, so it's using small IoT devices um, that is uh, uh, focused on uh, being extremely um, dis uh, distributable and at the same time to be eco-friendly, um, to also be environmentally friendly. 
And uh, basically what differentiates the blockchain is, is we're the first ever blockchain to use uh, what is called the ED448 Edwards curve, um, right. which is basically Goldilocks, also known as. And um, we also implemented, like, for example, NIST uh, standards. Uh, we can do a verified transaction in 42 seconds. Uh, it's about wow, six awesome. blocks per verification. Um, uh, so for, for a verified transaction, and it's uh, every seven seconds, there is um, a block mined and there's five coins per block. Uh, we mm -hmm. also have what is called ICANN standards, which is similar to IBAN standards for human legibility, um, also for um, checksum and all these types of things. It's also got an ISO 20022 pain protocol. It is a pain, but uh, that's basically <laughs> uh, swift messaging. And um, uh, it's, 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 it's the same as like a type of a swift messaging, which financial institutions can actually mm -hmm. implement this blockchain to, to have a legible transaction, which is taking place so that they can actually have the data available and process mm -hmm. it in their existing environments, because everything with us is about interoperability and cross chains. Um, right. so what we also did is, is, um, we, we have all the oracles and the APIs for the integration ready, uh, for any environment, um, in multiple languages. Uh, and then the next thing that we did is, is we then actually went and said, okay, well, given that Ethereum was sort of like, you know, we like to call them the grandfather, uh, mm -hmm. of smart contracts and things like this in a blockchain environment, given the name now, um, we then went and developed our own smart contract language, which is called YLM. Uh, YLM is very similar to Solidity. It takes about 20 minutes for you to port a smart contract from YLM uh, or from, from uh, sorry, from Solidity to, to a YLM platform. Uh, oh, wow. so, um, yeah, it is, it is really, um, it, it's really interoperable. Of, of course, it's got some different name functions and calling functions and things like this. Mm -hmm. But um, it's really easy to learn if you know Solidity itself. And then one of the very big aspects is the HD wallets, which we have, um, mm -hmm. which uh, no other smart contract black, uh, blockchain actually has, um, you know, uh, HD wallets built in. Um, so having built this blockchain, we then actually said, okay, well, it's quite important for us to to get the distribution and because our business is focused on equality, uh, equal opportunity, and of course, inclusion in active economies um, or uh, including excluded economies into active mm -hmm. economies. Um, what we then went and did is, is we said, okay, well, how can we get this distribution out to people? Because the IOT devices itself, I mean, our miners use something like eight to, to 10 Watts um, wow. to actually mine. And you get That's about really low power. one, yeah, you, you get about one kilo hash for that. Um, and the network, we, we actually have it live. It's coreblockchain.cc. A lot of people are mining already and, and participating in the network, which we're very excited about. We actually already have uh, forks um, from several people. You can actually go and have mm -hmm. a look at the GitHub and you will, you will see some of the people that have forked it, <laughs> which have hardware wallets and things like this. So that's also mm -hmm. very exciting for us. So the acceptance of the blockchain itself is pretty good. Um, and, and we're growing quite exponentially. Um, then, of course, to, to do the reach for us is quite important. Um, you know, we, we have one of the visions, which is connectivity is a human right. Uh, it should be like, it, you know, it, 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 any communication that you want to do, you, you actually should have a human right to it in a digital environment. So what we went and did is, is we went and built what is called the Luna Mesh. And that's a mesh network which um, we developed our own proprietary uh, protocols. Um, and these protocols can actually use multiple frequencies simultaneously, which is very unique to our mesh network. So it can use from radio frequencies to sub gigahertz and all these types of uh, different frequencies and free oh, wow. frequency environments. But of course, um, the Luna Mesh is um, not just focused on on you know providing a new form of connectivity it's also a last mile reach so if isps or um uh, internet service providers uh, or these types of companies are looking for um a, a much better and cost effective uh, manner to deploy in an area where they don't have any infrastructure this, mm -hmm. this particular network can actually be used to do that um, how, how so 
Um, well, because we open up, we, we, we actually allow for the ports to be opened up for the internet to be streamed into the mesh network itself, if the ISP permits it. If we take a partnership, of course, normally what we do is, is we use free frequencies where we are allowed to distribute this type of connectivity. But mm -hmm. if you do partner with an ISP, then you can go in higher frequencies, which is 2.4 mm -hmm. gigahertz or 5 gigahertz. Um, and basically, um, they then we, we then implement with them, for example, if they put up a, um, a fiber optic cable at the last point where they have this fiber optic cable, we can actually take the last mile reach and connect it to that fiber optic cable and distribute it through the mesh network, which, for example, if you need to deploy as a, as a mobile company or something like this, you need to deploy towers. Also, ISPs mm -hmm. needs to do this. This is extremely expensive. And to do so there's, a, there's actually a tower almost like 100 meters from my house. Like you yeah. can see them. Yeah, they're everywhere. And they're kind of ugly yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's not just about them being ugly. The, the problem is, is that um, for an ISP to actually have the feasibility to deploy such a tower, they need to have a ROI, which is uh, feasible, meaning they need enough users to actually utilize it to be mm -hmm. able to make the return on investment. In our mm -hmm. case, you don't need towers. We've got the mesh network that you can deploy devices that can use existing IoT infrastructure, which is mobile devices. It can be um, normal Raspberry Pis. It can be water meter readers. It can fully actually um, uh, generate uh, the connectivity network for a smart city, for various other um, uh, uh, use cases that, mm -hmm. that, that have already an infrastructure deployed and having this proprietary protocol, we're using things like, for example, um, uh, uh, Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth uh, as a form of entrance into the network. So mm -hmm. you can actually connect via Wi-Fi if you have one of our applications, which has Luna Mesh uh, implemented, you become actually a hotspot yourself and further the network itself. So it's a self-growing, self-sustainable and scalable network that actually uses its own infrastructure and existing infrastructure to deploy it further. And that's why we can actually be a last mile reach for any type of internet service provider. We also have the feasibility of um, having jamming or scrambling, uh, scrambling protection specifically in um, uh, sensitive and uh, emergency uh, communication networks where, um, uh, for example, in South Africa and in, in various other countries, they are jamming networks to try and uh, block off any communication if there's an emergency that needs to take place, either like a break-in or something like this, or mm -hmm. a heist that's taking place. Um, we can actually provide that connectivity because of epidemic routing, uh, which we actually implemented also, um, which is not just about carrying a message when there's, when there's no other devices, because one device can carry a message to another place where there's connectivity, which has delay. But mm -hmm. at the same time, epidemic routing allows you to actually distribute across multiple channels that makes multiple connections that sets, sends the same message in simultaneous directions. So even if one device is um, uh, scrambled or disrupted, the other devices are still getting the message out in exactly the same time. Um, oh, wow. And, uh, you know, we, we are uh, focused on IoT deployment using the existing infrastructure, which there are, there's billions of devices. And actually, they say in about 2024, there should be something like 50 billion IoT devices out there in the market, which wow. is exactly what can run our protocols and our things as long as they have a Bluetooth and a Wi-Fi connection. So they kind uh, of just act as little mini hotspots. Yeah, basically. Basically, it, it's like leapfrogging the network itself. Um, and then basically what we've done is, is having this blockchain that, that, that's actually running on this mesh network, you don't need internet to actually run the blockchain because wow. it can run on its own or we can run it in the internet at the simulta uh, simultaneously. So, mm -hmm. it, um, and what we're doing is, is we're busy setting up clusters and these clusters we're connecting via internet, which is why we're also, um, if they're too far out from each other, they can connect via internet and be able to um, still cross connect to different communities or, or mm -hmm. clusters. Um, what we've then done is, is we, we basically call this, we, we, I know it's a bold statement, we call it Internet 2.0, but mm -hmm. the reason is, is because 
it's a it's an entirely new network which is out there yeah. which uses yeah. multiple frequencies that's even got a blockchain which is running inside of it already as the first form of usability of a network when you have a look at the internet back in the day what makes the internet today today Firstly, it's all the applications that you have. It's email, it's uh, the websites that you're having, it's Google, it's these types mm -hmm. of environments, it's cloud-based solutions. That's actually what makes up the internet. And to be able to make our network feasible, this is where we went in. And we, we like to call it Web 4.0, but it is basically an expansion of Web 3, which is taking the vision and trying to really achieve that vision of what they had of being fully decentralized. Mm -hmm. um, and the first thing that we did is, is to be able to operate in a um, decentralized digital environment, you need basically a digital identity. Yeah. So this is the first thing that we went and built is, is we went and built a digital identity, which is not like any other digital identity out there. It is an entirely serverless, borderless, peer-to-peer, end-to-end encrypted, uninterceptable um, network and application that um, can do a full KYC, KYB, AMLP, PCFT, all the abbreviations of doing a, a verified or digitizing a government-issued document, which can be done mm -hmm. in any country in the world. Right. But at the same time, you as an individual are, you, you come with things, you come with family, you come with, you have investments, you have assets, you have uh, people around you, you have friends. Those are what we refer to as digital attributes. Now, mm -hmm. that can be from your medical data right through to your wife, to your child, to your dog, to your um, husband to your whatever. It can also be to your car, to your business, to your property, to your um, investment portfolio. Mm -hmm. You can prove your relationship or ownership to a particular thing or uh, an individual, then you can digitize it. And if you can prove the value, you can attach the value to that digital um, uh, identity. Now, being able to, to have that, we, we then said, okay, now we're actually able to recognize um, individuals and entities and things. And this is also basically entirely GDPR compliant and CPA compliant, Consumer Protection Act. Um, mm -hmm. It's like US uh, form of, of consumer protection as well as um, uh, the GDPR for um, Europe. For Europe. Yeah. So you have the right also to be forgotten because basically what happens is, is your digital identity is a proven digital identity, which is linked to the blockchain, which is linked to your wallet, but the data is not stored in that immutable ledger. It is stored decentralized, which is on your local devices and cold backups. You can even do a cloud backup if you want, which we have the feasibility and, and we, well, not the feasibility, we have the function uh, for that. Um, and it is triple encrypted basically with ED448. Um, so what we did is, is with this digital identity, we then said, okay, well, being able to do this, what are the functions that we can build with it? First and foremost, you can identify individual peers, but you can also use it as a new form of login. So MetaMask tried to achieve this and various other companies like two-factor authentication is trying to achieve mm -hmm. this. But what we did is, is we then said, okay, well, what would be one of the main functions and what would be one of the best aspects of the digital identity? If you want to register on a platform, you don't need to fill out a form. You don't need to remember a username or a password or anything because it does a decentralized login for you. You scan mm -hmm. a QR code and everything's done automatically. Every single time that you log in, you just scan that and it does a verification that you are really who you say you are and it cannot be falsified, which means also we have Vault as a service to even protect your data, which cannot be extracted, so it cannot be resold. That's fascinating because I know that, um, so Binance recently released their BAB token, which is Binance account bound SBT. Mm -hmm. um, that token, as far as I'm aware at the moment, doesn't store any data at all. It, like your data is still stored sent in a centralized manner with Binance and Binance and any other organization. I um, mean, I've talked to a lot of DeFi protocols 
um, that are concerned about the need for KYC because that means that their servers, they need to store it and safely store it. And that's a big burden for developers. And I'm sure it's um, a fairly large cost for, for Binance to be able to store all this financial information. So you're saying that your digital identities remove the need for that and store all that data in a decentralized way. So protocols don't need to worry about having that if it's a requirement, but they can still access the data. And is it like in a permissionless way they access it or? Well, basically, yeah, it's, it's an entirely user management platform and permission based uh, solution, which where is where which is why we developed also Vault as a service, which, for example, a company like Binance could integrate the Vault as a service, have access to their data on a permission basis. So depending on if the hierarchy of your of, of your organization, you decide who has what type of access, but they'll be able to showcase the data, they'll be able to view the data, the context extract the data, uh, but they can still pull their reports, do their things that they need to. But basically, they have control of, of their environment, but they cannot do anything with the data other than just view it. And the owner can actually stipulate what is the right that you can have to the data, which means me as the individual, if I have a Binance account, I can actually stipulate, okay, you're allowed to have this data, you pay me for the data, but however, <laughs> Basically, what happens is, is I can track and trace exactly what you're doing with my data. Oh, wow. So this is this is the one thing that we did. Um, we also then the next very important thing is, is we said having the feasibility of this type of data and because decentralized storage is quite important. And if you have a look at something like a Torrance network, which is what we use quite regularly in our platform to create this distribution and decentralized form of storage. The first thing that you need to have a look at is, is security and a little thing called steganography. So steganography is basically the encryption and decryption of a particular file or packet. And it is also with a permission basis, which has got private keys and things like this. But current solutions of steganography is primarily developed by companies like Widevine or uh, Real Networks. Um, and there's, there's several others, but they have basically a centralized solution where if someone does download the video and they share it in the Torrance network, they can't trace it in any case because then it's gone out of their network itself. In our mm -hmm. case, because we're, we're, we're embracing decentralized storage, we developed the steganography where we wrap every single packet with the decentralized digital identity that we then actually can prove in the blockchain itself that this individual has the right to, and it can stipulate what type of right, has the right to share it, has the right to download it, has the right to view it, has the right to engage with it. What type of right does, it, does this individual actually have with this packet of data that actually accumulates to one individual thing, whether it's a video, whether it's a, um, a encrypted file, whether it is a document, whatever it is in a digital environment. And this type of steganography that we built was specifically for that. Um, so, so you're saying that you're solving like video pi pro um, piracy as well? Yes, uh, copyright infringement, because it can actually, wow. so okay. if someone, if someone in the Torrance network actually leaks a private key, you can flag it down to exactly who that individual was. So it puts a decentralized environment. Look, having, you know, as uh, Spider-Man once said, with uh, great freedom comes great responsibility. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or with great power comes great, great, great power, responsibility. Yeah. But we're saying it with freedom. And basically the, the responsibility is on the individual and you're going to be held responsible for the actions that you're taking in such an environment. It is, it is your right to your data, but having the right to that data of what you are requesting, you have the responsibility to act responsible accordingly. So, mm -hmm. and can be held accountable for your actions because it's fully traceable. Um, of course, wallets are still, you know, there's still anonymity in wallets in core blockchain mm -hmm. and things like this, but this is specifically in financial environments or in environments where it's required that authentication should be there and mm -hmm. user management should be there. Um, what we then did is, is having this platform, we then said, okay, well, let's go on to a settlement platform because basically a settlement platform is what manages 
all the settlement, whether it's a financial or a data settlement, it's all data. Mm -hmm. So having our network and having, having the Luna Mesh and the blockchain network itself, we can settle any transaction in 42 seconds in anything wow. basically because we can digitize whether it's fiat or whether it is uh, a smart contract or whether it is a document or whether it is a peer-to-peer -peer verification 42 seconds a fully verified transaction can take place anywhere in the world and if financial wow. institutions integrate this system they can have the actual asset instead of an iou sent out which is basically like a mastercard network Mm -hmm. We can do the actual asset being available in 42 seconds right there and then. We even have the means to decentralize liquidity of providing a peer-to-peer -peer environment where you can actually be one level below, whether it's an exchange or a bank, that can actually find pairs and peers uh, with liquidity that they require that they don't have at that given moment, that they can actually do that type of settlement, um, which is becoming... A much more feasible master net, uh, MasterCard network because MasterCard is only telling you about an IOU and it's taking a debit mm -hmm. and a credit basically and it's stipulating which banks owes and which banks are credits and what are in what regions and they should settle in between each other. In our mm -hmm. case, you have everyone can do that automatically and they can even find the peer and they can do it in 42 seconds. Wow. Um, so having that settlement platform, of course, the distribution of this platform is is the, the final part of actually how we established web 4.0. And that is the distribution of using existing IoT infrastructure, uh, using telecommunication and ISP infrastructures. And then we have something which is our own proprietary um, hardware, which is called the Orb i2. And the Orb i2 is basically, um, it's a blockchain node, it's, um, a, a core blockchain miner, it is a connectivity node, and it's got decentralized storage all in one, which we can attach to a solar panel, we can attach it to a battery pack, and we can deploy it anywhere in any rural environment where there is no infrastructure or connectivity whatsoever, whether it's in an ocean or whether it is in the middle of the Sahara Desert, it doesn't matter. So it oh. can actually do the connectivity and do everything with that. And to make this feasible, we are currently developing what is called the decentralized um, uh, uh, search engine. And this, is, this will allow you to have a hosting platform for new forms of websites where you can use your digital identity to prove the ownership of your website to have a trusted environment where you can do financial transacting or communications or things like this. Um, and be able to trust that this website is real. You know, if you have a look at Facebook or many of these other stores mm -hmm. which are through right now many people are being scammed with being able to i have i'm even even i have bought a product or two which never arrived and the money was mm -hmm. <laughs> so so i i, I want i once bought a um it, it was a device that was meant to um allow me to stream my phone to a, a bigger screen and when it arrived it was just a piece of glass it was just a piece of glass that you put your phone on that was basically just a big magnifying mirror and i was like this is not what i bought like i i ordered this like really cool second screen touch screen device and i got a big mirror so yeah that, that's my my example of that yeah <laughs> yeah i i've i've, I've fallen uh, also uh, victim to some of those things um mm -hmm. but basically that's that's what we call web 4.0 and to make web 4.0 actually successful we then went and built several applications and um maybe i can i don't know if i can share this this diagram mm -hmm. um, so one. so basically what we then went and developed is is wall money which is a banking as a service and new banking platform we went and developed core pay which is a decentralized payment gateway but this payment gateway is a peer-to-peer -peer payment gateway we don't hold any funds it's it doesn't have any any holding capabilities whatsoever it's directly peer-to-peer -peer payment goes directly into your account and you don't wait for your money whatsoever we also went and oh, built a hybrid exchange which is the ping exchange and then of course Toki, which is the e-commerce platform um, which i told you which is how everything started mm -hmm. uh, the e-commerce platform uh, it's basically like uh, an Amazon or an eBay or Etsy or um, or Alibaba even, but it's a fully decentralized um, uh, platform which 
we have incorporated a lot of additional features, which is like the multi-cart where you can buy multiple products from multiple merchants in multiple kind of, uh, countries and multiple currencies with a singular transaction because of our payment gateway and the exchange itself. And then what we did is, is on top of that, we also integrated what is content recognition. And you can recognize any video, image, audio, as well as real time, which basically becomes a supportive marketing medium with an immediate call to action. And the, these are like just two of the features, but we have a lot more interesting features. We even have, for example, the unique stable token, uh, which allows merchants and customers to be able to earn additional income uh, while they are waiting for their products um, uh, through the means of staking, which is a very, very unique thing oh, wow. to this. Um, then what we went and did talking about video and, and uh, audio, we then went and we developed the Ting in the Meeting platform, which is basically a new version of YouTube um, and any video streaming, basically. But what we did is, is it's entirely serverless, borderless, peer-to-peer, end-to-end encrypted, uh, uninterceptable, and fully decentralized. And basically so what happens is... Basically you're saying it's not all reliant on AWS like most of... It's not. not it, there, it's yeah. not reliant on any of it. It is, it is distributed across so many different platforms, so many different devices. It's going to even use the Luna Mesh when it's fully deployed um, using that decentralized storage. We're already currently busy using some of that um, to actually distribute these videos. Um, and then what we've done is, is we seamlessly integrated with this platform. We actually integrated a video calling um, and OBS platform, and all of this is browser based. So you don't need third party applications or anything. You can stream oh, wow. directly to your channel or your playlist. But the best part about it is you can actually take ownership of that entire video when you are busy doing it. And you can also provide permission on whether it should be private or public. And the privacy you can actually have where an individual that you say, okay, right, with this core pass ID, they have the right to view this video. Or alternatively, mm -hmm. if someone wants to enter into a meeting, you can set up a secured meeting, which means you have to verify yourself and you can specify what information needs to be verified for them to be able to participate in a particular meeting. So you will no longer have people that can falsify themselves and no longer have bots which can influence their 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 platform it is real people based um, and this so is you're talking about civil civil resistance here yeah yeah wow but but basically you cannot falsify any account on the thing in the meeting platform it is fully linked to a core pass id and if you want to know really who the individual is behind it you can request this information of course, you need their permission. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, also, there is some protection and things like this, but it, it takes content creation and puts it into a new form of NFT value because you can also assign now your income streams to that video. You can assign your um, views that you actually have on the video, which are real, real views that you can actually monetize accordingly. You can... Uh, um, a partner up with brands and split the NFT where brands can earn such certain part of the video during the part where you are actually doing the advertisement because we don't do <laughs> any advertisement on our platform. So if you want to do advertisement, you'll have to do it inside and say it's sponsored by this brand and this is the collaboration that we're doing and this is why. And that brand can actually earn that, they can actually own that part. You can even take this and put this oh, wow. into another stable environment for a stable token secondary market, which can be traded for exiting and entering into, um, uh, it, um, exiting and entering into volatile markets. There's, there's so many things that we can do with a real tangible NFT in this platform of content creation, because content creation is actually one of the major income streams which are happening right now. If you mm -hmm. have a look at YouTubers and TikTokers and, uh, Instagrammers and Facebookers and I don't know what other platforms there are out there, but everyone is basically, a lot of people are earning money off of this and it's becoming a new means of the future, which is mm -hmm. where Metaverse is also going to go because it's all about this. And entering this into a Metaverse environment, you will have a secure, trusted digital world, which you can really, really trust. And just to finish off the last little part there, which is the Heyo, is basically what we went and we developed the Heyo platform 
um, using the same technology as the, the meeting platform, which is entirely serverless, peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, borderless, end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, and the most beautiful part about it is, is you can even do it without a SIM card or a Wi-Fi connection. You can actually do it without any connectivity whatsoever. Of course, it uses the Wi-Fi network, but you can do a direct peer-to-peer -peer call if someone is close enough in the vicinity, or you can leap from okay. it to the mesh network because it's got the mesh network and Luna built in. So if you're in a cluster and someone is on the, um, across town, which the network can still reach, you'll be able to phone that individual on a video or audio call or send the messages, which is entirely encrypted and secured, which is also wow. fully decentralized and unintercepted. And that's basically everything that we built in the last nine years up until today. So just a couple of things then. Just, oh, just, yeah. just oh, there's, there's, there, there's one last thing that I, that I did not mention, which is um, the thing that we're doing right now. It's unfortunately not on the, on the, on the screen no. here, but uh, it, is, um, it is the Vega NFT, um, which is a very unique NFT. Um, it's got basically you stake uh, 2,500 core tokens and you get a position of a miner, which is around about 750 hashes. And over a year's period, you stake it for one year into two locked pools. And basically what happens is actually it's the, it's the core token uh, hodler pool and the um, XCB hodler pool. And basically all that earnings and the tokens are held in these two pools, which validate the NFT's value and increases the value over a year period. At the end of the year, the NFT gets burned and you get all, you get the tokens and the coins, all the coins you mined, you actually get back. And you can even trade the NFT on the market itself. There's only 2000 available. We're currently selling those, but um, they are very unique to the core blockchain itself and i don't know of any other nft that's able to do this so you're kind of doing like hosted mining through an nft kind of thing yeah it's not just hosted mining but it's it's linked also to the core token itself because we have the core token and the core coin itself core token being a utility token which is for means of payment of services and smart contracts and uh xcb which is core coin which is the native currency of the blockchain itself so I mean, wow, <laughs> that's a lot of things. I mean, I, I just listening to you talk, there's like, I'm, I'm thinking of like obviously Ethereum or Solana or Cardano in terms of a decentralized network. You've got kind of Helium in terms of an internet of things. It seems like you're, you're bringing in a, a lot of what other companies or other projects are doing and like sort of viewing as their USP. And it's kind of being brought into one almost like you're cherry picking a lot of the sort of the stuff that's going on in, in web three um my question is, is going to be though it's like so why do we need this is 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 ethereum not good enough i mean i'm guessing you're going to tell me that daps on ethereum are 70 percent centralized on aws and it's not really decentralized it is is that your thinking are you do you view that web3 isn't really living up to what it was intended to be <laughs> You know, with the, um, look, they had an amazing vision, but the biggest problem is, is most of it is hosted on cloud-based solutions. Mm -hmm. And the biggest problem is, is that they're using centralized forms of connections. Um, mm -hmm. If a service provider also goes down, the network goes down. Mm -hmm. um, and in well, at least case, some of the, fr the front end parts of the, the network. Yeah. At least. Yeah. I, not the entire network, of course, because it is distributed, but also given the difficulties that Ethereum is going to face uh, very soon, which is primarily in going to proof of stake, um, a lot of eyes are on them. And right now they're, they're having a look at it as a security. Um, mm -hmm. In one way, it's good. In another way, it's not. And your biggest problem is, is that they've gone out of an entirely decentralized environment, which means a third party, non-known party can actually verify the transaction, which is what the means of distribution should be. And this is unfortunately one of the things, and with Ethereum, look, I have a lot of respect for Ethereum. Um, they did a lot of work and uh, they did a lot of groundbreaking things. Um, 
your biggest problem is, is when you have a look at the use cases itself, what type of use cases are out there that's actually really running on Ethereum? And I mean, DeFi, gaming, I mean, there is a host of things going on in, in this space. Yeah, but it's basically developing a token and having an in-app purchase. It is not actually utilizing the immutable ledger in the way that it should, that it could be used. It, no use cases are really focused on really looking at, we look at cryptocurrency, not at cryptocurrency. We look at it as, as blockchain. And blockchain is the immutable ledger and is the, is the network that you actually need to create a trusted environment, which can be an immutable ledger that cannot be altered, that cannot be falsified, and that can really put you into an entire new type of bracket, which can not only can it provide you a form of trust, but it can provide you a form of income. And just by participating in a network itself. This is our philosophy in all of our applications. And this is actually the additional thing that we bring to Web3, which Web3 did say, yes, we should have a more distributed um, uh, income stream and distributed uh, finance or, or, or um, uh, monetization. However, still focused on huge costly infrastructures because AWS and Google Cloud, this is not cheap to run these, these, these platforms. Mm -hmm. It costs a hell of a lot and it uses a lot of energy itself, um, even on running it on these types of devices. This is why we focused in the way that we've done to try and make it that it can be entirely freestanding. It can use solar power to actually run. I mean, to run an orb i2 with all the features and functions it's around about 20 to 25 watts. Wow. That's it. And it allows you to have decentralized storage, which cannot be cut off, which, I mean, you have to switch off the sun to cut off that distributed storage, <laughs> basically. And it becomes entirely distributed and decentralized in that manner, which I'm not, I don't want to talk bad about Ethereum or about any of the other blockchains. Look, there, there's fantastic networks out there. They have fantastic mm -hmm. technologies. They have fantastic solutions. But right now, what we're focused on and what we've developed in the last nine years is exactly what you said. We cherry picked what are the functions which should be in an entirely decentralized environment. And there's so many more functions and DeFi's that we're actually building and bringing on board. There's huge organizations which are looking at us at the moment, which we are actually in discussions with. Um, and we're super excited. I mean, we can, we can adapt our platform because of the entire ecosystem, because this is a real ecosystem that is like an entirely in, interoperable network that can work seamlessly with any, any um, aspect of the applications that we developed. Even the applications can work seamlessly on their own, but because they have the support of all the other applications, which is also distributed, they help distribute the network and help the participation to actually um, spread everything in, in, in our vision, which is inclusion, equality, and equal opportunity. Can you, can you talk about interoperability? Can you communicate with other blockchains? Yes, of course we can. We have the APIs and the oracles. We have the YLM smart contract platform. So even you can have certain parts of your, of your network running on Ethereum if you want, or on Solana or on Cardano or whichever, and you can utilize some of our platforms, no problem. So the Luna Mesh, which is a core part of the distribution. Um, I mean, I'm not going to be able to sort of stream video on my phone through that though, surely, because obviously I'm just using other people's connections. So what's the sort of max speed that you can kind of get if you are connecting kind of peer to peer? Um, you would be able to, uh, I can tell you oh. right now. Yeah. Oh, you, you what? Able to. Yes. But, but that's going to cut off someone else's connection though, surely, and make it so that they can't stream video. Like if I'm using someone else, like if, if my wife uses my hotspot, that lowers my speeds, no? Yeah, but let me explain to you. So your wife um, is using your hotspot, or let's say you become the hotspot. Mm -hmm. Let's say in your vicinity. So you, you have a look at the new Apple iPhone, which is out. Wi-Fi 6 with the new chipsets. The actual feasibility is three kilometers in an omnidirection on that chipset. Now, let's say there's multiple peers that are actually using the application and that have Luna Mesh running. 
Now, you know how a torrents network works. It's all about yeah, so distributing files everyone. across so you get a little bit from everyone. The entire <laughs> video streaming platform works in this way and has got the full steganography implemented into it with the core pass, which means it's even more secure than YouTube itself. So with you being with your wife connecting to you, you connecting to another device or people that are in the vicinity, everyone's starting to share and see these different types of packets. And because the network can actually distribute even further, even if you connect to clusters via the internet, they're still seeding the packets across border. So everyone's starting to seed and provide these packets. And of course, with the devices that we have with decentralized distribution, these are also seeding packets permanently. We've even written certain parts of the algorithm, even videos that aren't watched very regularly are still being seeded. And we have multiple ways on how we actually distributed this. But you'll be able to stream video, be able to um, make video calls, uh, do streaming like this, no problem. So that's when, when you say, Internet 2.0, you are talking about uh, an additional internet as the infrastructure. And I mean, that obviously is always like, I don't know if you go on like Bitcoin or something, like people that are against uh, blockchain technology, like as a subreddit, which I, I subscribe to just to hear the other sides of the arguments and see whether there's anything that we're kind of missing. Um, the, the argument is obviously, well, you switch off the internet and all your money's gone. Well, you're yep. talking about building the internet that it's very difficult to switch off. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's, look, it's not just that. Um, in this network, uh, like we discussed earlier um, in the, uh, last week, we have multiple layers that we actually developed. We have a communications layer. We have a messaging layer. We have a blockchain layer. The blockchain layer is consisting of three layers, which is the test net where you can actually build your test applications. We have the main net, which is the main net itself. And then we have the enterprise network, which large organizations or private institutions that need to have certain parts private, but is always, you are always connected to all these levels, all these layers that you're using as your form of communication linked to the blockchain that's proving that the transaction is there that can go into your private network that says, okay, the data is there and it is valid and this transaction can take place being proven in the blockchain, sending through the, 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 um, the, the communication layers, everything's built in there and it's built in multiple layers that we've actually done. And this is why we're saying we're cross chain because we have all of these, uh, oracles. And should another, should another blockchain, should another network, should um, a, a, a company just want to implement it, you don't need to delete all your software. It's specifically built that you, it can build on your existing software and, mm -hmm. and you can then actually take it further and you can even adapt some of our software if you would like. And that's why we built this ecosystem that it's, you know, it looks like an elephant right now, but how do you eat an elephant? You eat it piece by piece. And this is exactly how we built it, is we built these little oracles that you can adapt it piece by piece as you see fit. You don't have to just, you need this immediately and nothing else will work and take a red line through your software. No, no. First and foremost, if I walk into <laughs> a big organization and I say, put a red line through your software, they're going to say, mm, no, we just spent millions on this. This is not going to happen. <laughs> I mean, that's... So how many people have you got doing this? Because, I, I mean, I can't imagine this is just you and your dad by this point, surely. No, no, it's me, my dad, and Rastislav, and then 329 other people. Wow. <laughs> yeah, we, have, we employed cool. someone on Friday, so another one. So we're, we're, we're actively um, actually um, employing people, and we're, we're, we're really getting ready for the release itself also. So, yeah, but it's so. Nice. So the one sort of question I can then have is obviously you're building this um, in-house through uh, sort of a centralized company at the end of the day. Will the blockchain then still always be controlled by yourselves at the end of the day? It's the blockchain itself has got nothing to do with the company. The blockchain is the people's network. We built it into a foundation which you can actually participate in. You can go oh, and wow. look on the website itself. We don't own the blockchain. It's got nothing to do with us. We, we, we're just the active maintainers of the blockchain. 
but basically it's open source. You can oh, wow. go and do whatever you want with the blockchain itself. It's a distributed network. It allows for anyone to build any decentralized application, whatever they want to, they can actually go and utilize the network itself. So we don't own that blockchain whatsoever. We have no control over it. We have no say over it. It is the people's network. So we might be the founders of it, but that's it. So why have you done this, Oki? Like, this is, seems like a lot of work. I mean, in some, other than the fact of the world needs it, which I mean, I've not looked at any of the code in terms of like verifying it, but in terms of what you're telling me, like this sounds like you, you've you looked at all the things that aren't working in the traditional internet and all the things that aren't working in Web3 and tried to solve for both of them. Like that's a big task. Like that's got to be a lot of work and, and headache and you say pain, I think you said earlier. Like, <laughs> I don't imagine it. Well, you know, we have an amazing team and... Um, given my history of being able to really experience rural areas and understanding how um, how rural communities actually really work, I was extremely mm -hmm. touched by it. And, um, you know, I've done this primarily because myself, Michael and Rastislav, um, I, I have a lot of history. Um, which is more of a personal thing, which I will maybe one day later, I will really go into my personal parts, which you don't even know yet about. But um, my history has really led me to understand that there is so much untapped talent, people that are being looked down upon or being excluded only because they don't have infrastructure. And if someone's not willing to do something about it. The only way that you can do it is, is by developing technology that can allow people to do that. And not a lot of people want to take on such challenges, but if you haven't, you got to start somewhere. So we started mm -hmm. somewhere by building an infrastructure and then providing these services, which can start getting them already used to it. And, if you have a look at how these communities and how these people actually interact and work with each other, this is the most important thing for me is, is to give them the same opportunity as I had as a child and as I have in a first world country. You know, they, they have the right to that. And it's, it, is, it is actually our responsibility to create an environment for the future generation to come and the children shouldn't pay uh, for the sins of the forefathers. Mm -hmm. That's actually the main reason as to why we are doing this is so that it's really there. It's, it's, I know it sounds philanthropic and these types of things, of course, we're going to make some money off of it and things like this, but I'd rather, you know, do something that is lasting and that can really do something for the future generations than what I benefit from it myself. My pinned tweet on my Twitter profile is a, um, a quote by Chuck Palahniuk. The goal is not to live forever, but to create something that will. Yes, exactly. exactly. Um, and if you can create something that has an impact to help people that are in need, then that sounds, that sounds like a, a very worthy cause. So I, uh, I applaud you for, for going in, in that direction in what seems like you said nine years it's been in development. Yeah. Nine years. Okay. So after nine years of work, um, what's wh where people watching, listening, where, where can they kind of get involved? How long is it going to be before they can get involved? Okay. So we have right now, the core blockchain is live. Uh, very happy about that after nine years of development. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And um, right now, uh, we are actually, um, uh, we're about to release Core Pass uh, with an estimated date of around about 14th of October, but it could be delayed um, given if we find any bugs or something like this and we need to fix them. Um, but that's actually live for a test environment. And for this test, basically, um, the nice part about the test is, is it's an open test for developers, for normal users to get used to it. We have some bounties which are there. We have some fun activities that you'll actually be doing. 
uh, where you actually be using the test net itself and learn how to um, you know register yourself how to collect coins and tokens and these types of things cool. using uh, QR code scanning so there's a lot of very interesting things that we're going to be doing and then of course we have a bounty program for bugs specifically development bugs testing of smart contracts infiltration uh, penetration these types of things so nice. there's multiple tests yeah. we're using uh, an OWASP um, uh, type of um, calculation to the rewards um, so we're also inviting people to do that. Uh, then the goal is to actually reach a minimum of 10,000 verifications where we want to do something around about like 30,000 to 50,000 transactions. Um, we really inv invite anyone to come and participate. Um, once we've reached the volume, um, and if there are no bugs, we will immediately go live with the application. Uh, with that okay. application going live, we're actually going live at the same time with Ping Exchange, which is the only exchange that lists Core Coin and Core Token right now. Um, and what we will be doing is, is um, we we are already in discussions with some other exchanges that are uh, willing to to start listing the the coin and the token also. But mm -hmm. for right now, this would be the only place where you can actually get involved or own Core Token and Core Coin, um, and then. Uh, we will be releasing the Ting and the Meeting platform. We're hoping uh, for this year, but it could be quarter one uh, next year. Uh, very early stages of quarter one. Uh, Core Pay will be released with the Ting and the Meeting also in the first quarter, basically of 20, uh, 2023. Mm -hmm. uh, if we can do it still this year, we would love to, but let's see. Um, mm -hmm. The Luna Mesh is also around about quarter one. We already have the beta tests in Europe. Uh, we have several places where we're actually testing it, and it's it's actually going very, very well. Uh, we're very, oh, very brilliant. satisfied with it. Um, Heyo application also around about quarter one, 2023. Um, the Toktoki application is quarter two, 2023. And then War Money, the banking as a service, also in quarter two, 2023. And then if you want to get your hands on the Vega NFT, you're welcome to go to pod.store. And uh, it is like a server buying platform. <laughs> but that's basically where we're selling the NFT. Um, so uh, yeah, if you want to also get involved with the NFT itself. Wow. So a busy next sort of six months for you then, I imagine. Uh, yeah, I would say it's uh, it's making me more gray. <laughs> <laughs> what about what about the mining side of things? Um, what if people want to start getting into mining? Because obviously, with Ethereum going to proof of stake, uh, there was a lot of uh, network hash that didn't go anywhere. That hasn't done anything. And um, I've got sort of uh, groups where I talk to, to the mining community, um, and they're obviously very interested in different options at the moment. Um, so if someone wanted to, to mine the token, how can they get into doing that? Well, they can go to a website called catchthatrabbit.com. Um, really? Is that actually it? Yeah, it's called catchthatrabbit.com. <laughs> That's the pool. Okay. And there you can actually, it's got a full tutorial there where you can actually get started. It also tells you how to download the wallet. Um, it uh, takes you to directly to the places where you can download the miners. Uh, you can also go onto GitHub and check it there. Um, and then basically all you need is a CPU. So if you've got an old computer standing around, old laptop or whatever, please, please participate in mining. The more people we have in mining, the the better the network is distributed. So is there, so if I'm, if I'm mining, does it matter what sort of CPU I'm using? Is there some better than others still? Or Of course, there are better CPUs, you know, but you got to find the sweet spot, you know, of what is the best CPU for the best power consumption itself. Uh, we're primarily focused on IoT devices, which are actually, you know, mining uh, specifically, you know, on we're, we're trying to focus on renewable energy and these types of things. But uh, you can use any CPU, whether it's a laptop, whether it is um, a Raspberry Pi. Um, we even have an Android miner, which is running now, so you can even mine on your phone. So if you have an old telephone lying around, go and mine on that. Um, we have basically everything that you can, anything that's got a CPU in it, uh, even your television, you could probably get to mine if you want. I'm going to challenge you to that. <laughs> You're gonna get people mining on the smart fridges and stuff like that's. This is something that we're, yeah we um, 
we will definitely be looking into it um, where uh, TVs and smart devices, even a Roomba uh, vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Mine, mining whilst it's vacuuming. I mean, I love it. It's like you're literally mining the house. <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah. So, so we're, we're looking at these types of things. So, but anyone that wants to participate can go to that place, uh, catch that rabbit. Also, if you want to check transactions which are happening, you can go to, um, I think it's block in, uh, block in, uh, index.cc. I'll be back. I there we go. I, I didn't close the tab. I clicked on a on a um, on a bookmark which was up here, and it, it just replaced this tab with that one, which was the block. Sorry, so, so I, I, so I can edit that out. So um, you, if you've got the right URL, you were saying about the block explorer. So we'll just go from there. Yeah. Okay. So uh, if you want to go and see your transactions, uh, you're welcome to go and have a look at uh, blocks index uh, blockindex.net. Uh, which has got the entire transaction viewer of core blockchain itself. Um, and you can uh, check out your mining there. Also, you can check out your mining and catch that rabbit and transactions which are taking place there. Of course, the first UI uh, for the wallet itself will be the core pass application. So you'll have a nice UI where you can actually start transacting. You can transact in your coins if you know how to use uh, the console itself. And mm -hmm. you can send it to different wallets and things like this, but we're getting the UI now ready uh, for it itself. So at the moment, is it the wallets only Linux based? Is that correct? Um, well, actually, you, I've done it on my Mac. I've done we've people have done it on Windows, and they've also done it on Linux. So you've got the wallet in in three different uh, places that you oh, can cool. actually generate it. Cool. Well, I will have a look at that myself then, because I'm always interested. Like, I was mining Chia, I used to mine Ethereum, my, I, I mined Dogecoin in 20, 2014. So I'm always down for, for, I've got a Helium miner that has made me $13 in six months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was like, I, I, I ordered it when it would have been profitable, and it arrived two years later when it was no, oh. not profitable either. Oh. Oh, dearie, dearie, dear. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, it's interesting and it's like, it's not about for me about making loads of money. It's about um, experiencing new technologies uh, and the concept of a truly decentralized network that is um, sort of censorship resistant in terms of not like ISPs can't turn you off. That sounds really interesting to me and I'm super excited. So um, you said that the, the test is penciled in for the 14th, but could be delayed. Where would be the best place to find out about joining on that test and finding out any updates in terms of when it will actually happen? Primarily on our Telegram channels, uh, on our social media channels. And then uh, we have a Medium blog also, uh, which you can find there. Um, and then what we will be doing is, is we'll probably be on the CorePass website itself, um, corepass.net. Uh, we will actually distribute um, a lot of information there also. We will probably upload the new website and uh, also say this is where you can partake. Um, of course, there will be a native Android application that you can download and there will also be a iOS, uh, which you have to download through test flight. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will actually be doing a release of the video. I think it will be either this week or next week, 
we will be releasing, I think probably next week, we will be releasing the video to showcase exactly what the test is, how the test works, explain a little bit more about the core pass, about the wallet itself, what type of transactions mm -hmm. we're looking for. Also explain a little bit more about the bounty program and things like this. So probably in the beginning of next week, I think will be the right uh, time. So uh, specifically, we are very communication. Uh, we're communicating a lot uh, on our uh, social media channels and delivering all the news there um, primarily. But uh, we you can have a look at the Core Pass website also and also on Cotech, Cotech.cc. Cotech.cc, brilliant. Okay, well, um, you officially completely smashed the, the the record for the longest podcast that we've had. Um, but I'm just, I mean, I feel like we've still fit in like so much into a small uh, period of time. I'm super excited to see where this could go. As I said at the very beginning, um, I'm not saying you are going to be the next Google, but I think if there was a project that has the the impetus to to build out a new infrastructure that could really change the way things are doing, uh, this is one of the ones that I am super excited about because you're just doing so many amazing things um and i'll be keen to see i think one of the if any, anyone is any naysayers i guess the fact that you're doing like this open bug bounty right at the beginning like is a prime example you're saying come on then come and hack us come and prove that we're not doing what we say we're doing and that's fantastic to see and that's what projects should be doing so um okie it's been an absolute pleasure i am very sure we'll be speaking again uh, in the future um, and I will definitely be interested uh, in getting into this uh, core pass and doing some mining myself. So I'll let you know how we get on there. But okay. until the next time we speak, um, thanks for joining us. Um, and is there anything you'd like to say before you go? I'd like to say, Akiba, thank you very much for the interview. It was really fantastic. And also to all the Crypto Slate members, you guys are doing a fantastic job. Uh, love your platform, by the way. Uh, it was a great honor for me to be on the, on the call. And then um, to, the, to the people out there, Get involved. Come try and hack us, please. <laughs> we're, we're really open to it. Please, please, please. We want to make sure that uh, you guys are as protected as possible. And we want to make sure that we distribute the network. Participate in the mining, please. And if you want a Vega, go and get one. You know where to. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Oki. Let's see you again soon. All right. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.